Hey y'all, welcome to part two of the Obscure Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg Explained. A mystery iceberg with a lower body count than most. That's right, this iceberg is not as dark, but that doesn't mean it's any less entertaining or intriguing. Actually, some of these are so off the wall that it's funny. And before we start, I want to give thanks to the ones who voted for this video, the wonderful members who make this channel possible. And if you would like to vote on future videos, you can join the channel membership by clicking the link in the description. So let's get into the rest in position. Grab the popcorn. We are going on a journey through the bazaar. May 1573, Catania, Sicily, Italy. A man by the name Alberto Gordoni, a fairly respected member of society who worked as an artisan and gardener, was walking through the town square when he, according to numerous witnesses, suddenly and inexplicably vanished into thin air. The witnesses in the area immediately began to look for him, expecting to find him in a nearby building or house, but they did not see him. Others thought that maybe he had fell into a hole or something, but there were no ditches or any kind of pits in the area that he could have fell into. Needless to say, everyone was baffled. In that instant, Alberto Gordoni simply vanished from the face of the earth. Days would turn into weeks, and weeks into months, and months into years, and Gordoni remained missing. Gradually, the townsfolk forgot all about him and his bizarre disappearance. That is, until 22 years later, when Gordoni, again according to witnesses at the event, appeared suddenly in the same place that he had vanished from the two decades before. And if that's not crazy enough, Gordoni did not look like he had even aged one year during the whole time he had been missing. Townsfolk who had remembered him and the strange disappearance would finally get around to speaking to Gordoni and they asked him what had happened all those years ago and where he had been. Gordoni surprisingly would insist that he had not vanished at all and for him those 22 years he was gone never even happened. They did not exist. Now here I have to point out that this supposed journey or wherever Gordoni had been, left him, according to some people, feeble-minded. And that might be why, according to some sources, he ended up in a mental institution. And just like previously, when everyone just forgot about him disappearing, well, people again just shrugged their shoulders at his reappearance and his story and went on with their lives. But this story gets a little bit weirder. It would take seven years living in a mental institution before Gordoni would finally speak about what happened that day. He would request to talk to a local priest slash doctor named Mario and tell him the following story. The day he had vanished, he had seen a strange shimmering tunnel in front of him. Alberto would somehow suddenly fall into this tunnel and it took him to a white and ambiguous world. There were no objects, only weird mechanisms that were unrecognizable to him. He did notice something similar to a small canvas covered with stars and dots, each of which pulsated in its own way. On top of that, there was one tall, thin, human-like figure with long hair who Gordoni believed was female. She told Gordoni that he had fell into a crack of time and space and it would be very difficult to get him back. Alberto pleaded to be returned, but the creature was in no hurry and she would begin to tell him information and knowledge about the realm of existence he found himself in. She would claim to him that the eternally young, as well as the souls without flesh and body, resided here. While thoughts moved at the speed of light, perhaps even stranger, were the claims of flying cities that she spoke of. It was only after this insane discussion that Alberto was finally returned to where he had been standing. He would tell the priest he felt like he had been gone for a half an hour tops, and that he would have never guessed he had been gone for 22 years. And as crazy as all this sounds, the priest Mario was apparently convinced that Gordoni was speaking the truth. He believed him so much that he took Gordoni back to the place where he had vanished all those years ago, just to see what would happen. When they got there, Gordoni suddenly and inexplicably disappeared again, and this time for good. Mario watched the whole thing in awe. After the shock of what had happened passed, Mario began to study. He believed at this location existed a gap in time and space, and in this gap, was a realm where time flowed slower than Earth, and the entities that resided here, at least some of them, were not of the good nature. 
So Mario ordered a fence to be built around it and called the area the Devil's Trap. Before we get to theories, I have to point out, there are several slightly different versions of this story out there, especially on the internet. The English versions do seem to have some translation issues from the original account, which might actually be the reason there are slight discrepancies in this story, such as some accounts state Gordoni was walking with his wife when this happened. Other accounts say he was not walking around a town square, but instead in the gardens of a wealthy estate owner. Assuming this account is true, what really happened? One theory you see pop up a lot is that of an interdimensional doorway. Is it possible that Gordoni somehow fell into another dimension? You will see this theory sometimes connected to David Pilates and some of the missing 411 cases. The second theory is that of an alien abduction. Maybe the canvas with stars and dots Gordoni described may have actually been what he was seeing in outer space. Maybe the tunnel he suddenly found himself in was actually a UFO. Finally, let's take a look at the origin of this story. It seems to have first made its way into the modern era by the way of an article in the magazine called Planet X back in July 2005. And in that article, no source is listed. Furthermore, there's no caged-in area called the Devil's Trap that has ever been found in Italy, meaning the entire thing is probably nothing more than a hoax. November 23rd, 1953. Air Defense Command Group Intercept Radar Operators at St. Sue Marie, Michigan would identify an unusual target over Lake Superior, an F-89C Scorpion jet from the nearby Ken Ross Air Force Base would be scrambled to go investigate. This jet was piloted by 1st Lieutenant Felix Moncla, with 2nd Lieutenant Robert Wilson acting as the Scorpion's radar operator. And it was Wilson who just had a difficult time tracking the object on the jet's radar. So they would be forced to go to the ground radar operators, who would then give Lieutenant Moncla directions toward the object as he flew. Moncla would eventually close in on the object at about 8,000 feet in altitude. Ground control would note the two blips on radar, one the Scorpion, the other unidentified. The Scorpion's blip grew closer and closer until they seemed to merge. At first, it was believed Moncla had flown either under or over the unidentified object, but moments later, one of the blips disappeared. Ground control became worried that the two objects had crashed into each other. Strangely though, the blip that Moncla was pursuing continued on its previous course. After this, attempts were made to contact Moncla on his radio, but no one replied. A search and rescue attempt was then quickly started by the United States Air Force along with the Royal Canadian Air Force, but neither found a trace of the plane or pilots, although bad weather did hamper the search. An investigation into what had happened began almost immediately, and according to the United States Air Force, the blip on the radar the crew went out to intercept was that of a Royal Canadian Air Force C-47 Skytrain, which accidentally traveled off course. The two would merge, as would typically happen in an interception, but strangely, Moncla's aircraft vanished. Even the IFF signal disappeared after the two aircraft merged as one on the radar, and although crews could not get a hold of Moncla or Wilson via radio, at least one other pilot on the search stated in his testimony to the accident board that he believed he did hear a brief transmission from the pilot 40 minutes after the plane disappeared, which makes it even more weird. The Air Force investigators originally believed Moncla may have experienced vertigo and crashed into Lake Superior. According to the investigation, they said he had been known to experience that from time to time, but when they pursued these leads further, they found out that the other airmen of Lieutenant Moncla's organization who had told them this reported that it was actually just hearsay, and none of them had actually personally witnessed Moncla experience vertigo. So in the final report, vertigo would not be listed as a possible cause. Now here's the interesting part about all this. Not only did Moncla and Wilson's aircraft disappear mysteriously, but that Canadian aircraft they were pursuing? Yeah, there wasn't one. At least, the Canadian government claimed there wasn't. And they've stuck to those claims ever since. Which of course leads to the question, what exactly was this craft that was picked up on radar that caused the Air Force to immediately scramble a jet? Well, it would be two years later 
when former American Marine and UFO writer Donald Kehoe would write a book, The Flying Saucer Conspiracy, in which he claimed that he had received a telephone call telling him of a rumor from the airfield that the F-89 from Kenross, obviously the one piloted by Moncla, had been hit by a flying saucer and that it was covered up by the Air Force, which of course they denied. The jet has never been recovered or even found. However, in October 1968, aircraft parts were found near the eastern shore of Lake Superior. The Air Force would confirm the parts were from a military jet and the media speculated that it could be from Monkla's jet. However, the identity of the parts were never published and strangely enough, the Canadian government reported they have no record of that find. eighteen ninety one Albany, New York. Michael Griffa was hunting along the Hudson River when he saw something moving upstream. This creature he thought was a turtle, so Michael would do like any of us, and he decided to shoot it. He would then drag it out of the water and take it back to his hometown in Troy, where the local newspaper covered the story, because you see, this wasn't a turtle. This cryptid was about two feet long, and its back was covered with coarse hair. The underside was the color of human flesh and its features and trunk had a striking resemblance to that of a female child. It had wings measuring 20 inches from tip to tip, four legs, two fins, and a tail somewhat resembling a pig's, and it had a well-developed chest and breastbone. Michael would take the creature and hang it up on the wall of his store with its underside exposed. Visitors would come away impressed with its grotesque human features. Doctors in the area would be asked to come by and examine it, and when they did, they had no idea what it was. It would eventually be placed in alcohol and sent to the Smithsonian in Washington. The cryptid would later become known as the Hudson River Patchwork Monster, and it's the only sighting of its kind. Well, sorta. See, the Patchwork Monster is just like the name implies. It's a cryptid patched up of different animals and sometimes human, so each one is unique and the one in Hudson River in 1891 was just the first documented sighting, but far from the last, because 12 years later, in Kansas, a miner on a night shift would take off into the night screaming. When his three co-workers turned around to see what he was running from, they seen a creature they described as having long hair, great big eyes, inhuman looking, although it stood like a man. The paper would record that the men thought it was a spirit or devil, Around this same time, in the Sutherland Mountains in New Jersey, a boy would spot what he thought was a cow until it turned around and he seen what appeared to be a man at the front of the animal, only he was grown into the neck of the animal, sort of like a minotaur. It had horns, hands, four hoof feet, a tail, and fire red eyes. The occasional sighting would be reported throughout the early century, and if you think that maybe this could be attributed to the journalism of the time. Well, as late as 1996, a patchwork monster turned up as roadkill in De Quincey, Louisiana. According to the paper, it was the size of a very large dog and was covered with thick, woolly hair. It had the general appearance of a dog, except for the face, which looked somewhat like that of a baboon. The limbs were also small and frail looking, but had large shoulders and no tail. But back to the Hudson River patchwork monster, was that the imagination of Michael Griffa and the several hundred witnesses who went into the store to view the creature? Most likely not, but there is a good possibility that it came from the imagination of the writer who penned the account in the Buffalo Courier. However, I guess there is a tiny chance that it is some kind of weird cryptid. Two thousand three, a man named Scott Taylor would take a trip to visit his brother in the Scottish Highlands. While spending a few days with him, the brothers would decide to drive over to a friend's house one night about 7 p.m. His brother Stuart was in the driver's seat while Scott rode shotgun. The journey took them along many winding dark deserted roads, often flanked by tall trees. As they made their way by the nearby town of Kingusi, Scott would note a tall figure on the left-hand side of the road that seemed to be human and appeared to be illuminated by a great number of Christmas tree style lights. He thought that it was some kind of mannequin 
that had been decorated in an amusing way to advertise a local business. He laughed and asked his brother what it was, but Stuart had no idea, and he seemed a bit disturbed. As they got closer, Scott would report that he saw that the figure had its back to them and was seated on a bicycle and was completely still and perfectly balanced despite being mid-cycle. The whole thing kind of made him feel uneasy, and while they were visiting their friend, he couldn't get the strange sight out of his mind. So on their way back, he would ask his brother to slow down as they got close to where they had seen that weird thing earlier, because Scott wanted to see just what this figure was advertising, or at the very least, see what it was for. But when they came back through, the figure was now on the opposite side of the road, and it was now wearing a luminous green workman's tunic. Him and his brother would both kind of be disturbed by the whole thing and left. This account came from an issue of the 40 End Times, and it is a standalone story, so it's hard to find any other info about this event online. So we are left with a couple of theories. First is that of a reality glitch, which you know what that is. Anomalous events that seem to breach the basic rules of normal reality, which doesn't seem likely to me. Secondly, is the whole thing was a paranormal event, and that entity was some kind of spirit or ghost. Lastly, and finally, the most likely one, is highway hypnosis. You may not be familiar with this term, but you almost assuredly have experienced it. It's when a driver zones out while driving without remembering what occurred in that specific period, also known as the white line fever. In this state, the driver's conscious mind is focused elsewhere while seemingly still processing the information needed to drive safely. Highway hypnosis most often occurs when driving on long straight roadways that have few turns and therefore becomes monotonous. And just coincidentally enough, most paranormal experiences on the road typically take place at night and on roads that go straight ahead for long periods of time, or have some looping, providing a plausible link between paranormal sightings and highway hypnosis. And just like the story with our two brothers, they were on a long drive, one that had many winding dark deserted roads, meaning both brothers may have been experiencing highway hypnosis. Although, to me, that doesn't explain how they both had the same hallucination. So I wonder if maybe someone had just set up a spooky mannequin and then moved it to the other side of the road. I assume most of you know who Chris Benoit is, but for the minority that doesn't, I'll give a brief summary. He was a professional wrestler slash former champion in WWE who over a three-day period from June 22nd to June 24th, 2007, murdered his wife Nancy and their seven-year-old son Daniel before hanging himself at their residence in Fayetteville, Georgia. Nancy had died of asphyxiation the first night and was found with blood under her head. Their son Daniel was killed the following morning, and then that Sunday evening, Benoit hanged himself. There's been numerous theories as to why he did it, including severe CTE, which happens a lot in athletes in contact sports such as football, wrestling, hockey, rugby, and soccer. Its symptoms include mood problems and problems with thinking, and it only gets worse over time. It's thought the CTE mixed with steroid and alcohol abuse and a failing marriage were the main reasons behind it. But the reason as to why is a mystery for another time. The mystery here is the Wikipedia premonition controversy. And you're probably thinking the wiki what? So as mentioned, Benoit would commit suicide himself that Sunday after killing his wife and son over the previous two days. That Sunday though, a pay-per-view with a huge match scheduled for Benoit was supposed to take place. But he had already called in citing that his family had food poisoning and he could not make it, which was then seen as odd because Benoit never missed scheduled matches, but they assumed, hey, they must be really sick. But the next night, Monday Night Raw was scheduled to take place in Corpus Christi, Texas, and again, Benoit was scheduled to wrestle, except now, no one had heard from him in over 24 hours, which was seen as extremely odd. Now, WWE officials were beginning to worry, so sometime that afternoon, they would call the Fayetteville, Georgia Police Department to request a welfare check on the Benoit family. At 5.15 p.m. Eastern Time, the police department would contact WWE and let them know they had discovered the three bodies and it was now ruled a major crime scene. 
although other sources claim that they were found around 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And now we get to the crazy part. On the Chris Benoit Wikipedia article, an update had already been made, one that read, quote, Benoit was replaced by Johnny Nitro for the ECW World Championship match at Vengeance, as Benoit was not there due to personal issues stemming from the death of his wife, Nancy, end quote. That last part about the death of his wife had been added to the original statement at 4.01 a.m., meaning that it had been posted nearly 14 hours, or 10 depending on the source, before the Benoit family was discovered by the police. This Wikipedia entry, once it reached the mainstream media, become a huge part of the story. The anonymous editor, who probably started feeling the heat, would then go on to Wiki News, which is a part of Wikipedia, and explain that it was a huge coincidence and nothing more. However, detectives were now interested in this alleged coincidence, especially since it came out that the IP address of the editor was traced back to Stanford, Connecticut, the home of WWE headquarters. The anonymous editor was eventually traced back to a 19-year-old college student at the University of Connecticut named Matthew Greenberg. Detective seized his computer and called his post an unbelievable hindrance to their investigation, but did later state he was uninvolved and they did not press charges. Greenberg, for his part, would explain that he had seen the wrestling rumors online that night, and that was what had led him to posting the update to Wiki, but he admitted he made a mistake. However, this has led to the mystery did Matthew Greenberg have a premonition of this news and posted it a half a day ahead of when the bodies were discovered? I'll let you decide. If you have followed this channel for a while, then I know you are familiar with cryptids and especially Sasquatch. And although you may not be familiar with the term para-apes, most of you will probably have at least have heard the theory behind it. Para-apes Look at the Sasquatch slash Bigfoot not as a flesh and blood type cryptid, but instead links it to the supernatural, which ultimately explains how there have been so many sightings over the years, yet not one body has ever turned up. One of the earliest researchers that really pushed this theory was investigator Donald Worley. Worley would pitch the idea that Sasquatch is a controlled creation of an alien intelligence. His reasoning is this. Their population is seen basically all over the globe. In North America, they are called Sasquatch or Bigfoot. The Yowie in Australia, Almas in Central Asia, Mapangari in the Amazon, and Yeti in the Himalayas. And despite hundreds of thousands of sightings since the 1800s, not one being has ever been delivered to a laboratory, which indicates that this is not a flesh and blood type creature. Instead, he contends that these beings may be better thought of as in-betweeners because of their ability to appear and vanish at will. He has cited certain events which back up his claims, such as one I'm pretty sure we covered in a previous video, when 14 tourists saw a Sasquatch or Swamp Ape in Florida which walked a 40 half foot circle around the bus and then disappeared over an embankment. But this is not the only story that he cites. He further mentions the numerous instances when different hunters or just people who had a gun within reach, fired off shots and hit these beings. The fact that so many Sasquatch have been hit by gunshot with no effect is important because it points out that they may be here in a transitory state on the earthly plane. At the time of his research, which I cannot find a date on, but I'm pretty sure it's the early 2000s, Donald Worley had counted at least 26 such instances of a person shooting a para-ape, to which that being then kind of swatted at like he was trying to hit a fly or, in some cases, let out a scream and ran. One woman in Uniontown, Pennsylvania fired at a Sasquatch just six feet away with a 16-gauge shotgun. As she claimed, the creature vanished with a flash of light. Then, we come to the last point Worley makes for his claim, which is the sightings of UFOs that always appear hours, days, or even weeks before the cryptid is spotted. For example, in one case, in Rochdale, Indiana, at least three dozen people reported seeing a huge red-eyed beast over a period of seven weeks. It all started when a luminous light came down and silently blew up over a cornfield nearby. The being that came after this craft was said to be able to run over mud without leaving a track, 
and it was apparently transparent. Another time, four glowing oil tank sized UFOs were spotted over a distant tree line in which they projected light beams down along with presumably these creatures. Because it wasn't long after that that reports of giant black forms with glowing red eyes were seen in the area. One farmer and his brother even ran a barbed wire fence around his house and then got on the roof and waited for them. It was here over the next week they would fire off into the woods at these creatures and after seven days and a ton of shells they had nothing to show for it. The farmer, Ray Davis, would even claim that two of them got close to the barn and he tried to talk to them but they did not respond, obviously. So he unleashed a volley of 12 gauge Mossberg shells into the beings and he knew that he had hit them. The creatures screamed and retreated and again the next morning no bodies were found. Supposedly members of law enforcement and the media came out and found nothing either and left believing the whole thing was a hoax. But it apparently shook up the farmer enough that he and his wife moved. Worley has further elaborated that in New Jersey at least 60 persons reported seeing an ape type creature along with ruby red UFOs and triangular craft. In Saugus, California on the Santa Clarita ranchers reported seeing UFOs and several para-apes that wore glowing blue belts. There are also, according to Worley, abductee cases in which these para-apes are seen inside the UFO, which must be a shock to be abducted and then see Bigfoot on top of it. However, even in the world of cryptids and Bigfoot, Worley's theory is usually not taken seriously and some even think it does more to hurt the believability of cryptids such as Sasquatch, but I'll let you judge on that. $7.7 billion. That is the estimated gross box office earnings worldwide for the Harry Potter movies since 2001, an astronomical number. Even the book series itself, written by J.K. Rowling, is the best-selling book series in history, having sold more than 600 million copies worldwide. And I can't find the exact dollar amount that ends up being, but Rowling got at least 15% of that, which that, plus the movies, plus all the other Harry Potter royalty fees that she gets, well, she has made over a billion dollars easily. But what if I were to tell you this writer who gifted the world with a series that will live on for centuries, what if I told you she didn't exist? Because according to Norwegian film director Nina Grunfield, that is the case. You see, Nina would share this conspiracy theory way back in 2005 where she would question if Rowling could have been the sole creative force behind the book and movie Empire. But where does Greenfield actually get this? Well, she actually cites Rowling's origin point as a writer. If you don't happen to know, like I didn't, Rowling had long been viewed as sort of a model for single moms and moms in general, presented as something that they all could be. Because according to J.K. Rowling, before the success of Harry Potter, she was a poor single mother. She was getting the equivalent of $103 per week from Social Security while living in a mouse-ridden flat. She stated she was poor as possible in modern Britain without being homeless. After experiencing a failed marriage, the loss of her mother, being jobless and perpetually broke, she became depressed and contemplated suicide. She eventually recovered and began writing in cafes. Sometimes, it's even claimed, she was writing these stories on napkins. While doing secretary work for $22.50 a week, because if she earned any more, she would lose her government benefits. Then, of course, she would complete the first book, and it was rejected by 12 publishers before finally breaking through, and the rest is history. But Greenfield cites that this story is fantastic and gives hope not only to single mothers around the world, but all mothers with unrealized dreams and, most importantly, strong purchasing power. Furthermore, she points out, can a person be so productive and commercially successful in the media industry where nothing is left to coincidence. Going on this, she would ask if it was possible for a person to write six thick books that are translated into 500 languages and would sell more than 250 million copies in less than 10 years. Is it probable that the stories then get filmed and commercially exploited to the degree they did without a well thought out strategy or highly professional people behind them? Greenfield obviously thought not and took it a step further and stated that Rowling did not exist at all. She instead floated the idea that the books were produced by hack writers 
like the ones that produced the Nancy Drew mystery series for young readers and was then sold under the name Carolyn Keene, a woman who did not exist. And just like then, Rowling now is the product of Bloomsbury Publishing and Warner Brothers. And the real story behind Rowling is a closely guarded secret. And that secret will come out once the market for Harry Potter is saturated or until the actress playing J.K. Rowling gets tired of the role or the real authors behind the J.K. Rowling pseudonym come out and demand recognition. However, Rowling's defenders point out that it took her three years to finish book four, which if a team was working on this would not be the case. Secondly, is that Rowling's weaknesses as a writer are consistent between book to book, and that's not a mistake that a group of writers would make. It may be hard to believe, but for the longest time, there was the thought that the long-tailed monkeys of South American jungles did something unique, dare I say, extraordinary, that separated them from the monkeys of Africa and Asia, and that is, bands of resourceful monkeys would cross crocodile-infested rivers by forming themselves into a living bridge. Generations of children's school books would show how one monkey would clutch a branch as the anchor man, while another one would curl their tails around the monkey behind them to form the next link in the chain. And when long enough, they would swing to and fro until their momentum carried them out across the river. The monkey on the end would then grab a branch on the opposite bank, securing the chain while the old and young monkeys hurried across. If this was true, it would show an example of collective intelligence and social organization that we never thought possible. But it's not true, or is it? That's kind of where this mystery lies. So let's go back and find the origin of this story. We know that Alexander von Humboldt, a German naturalist and explorer, wrote in 1953 that he believed the story of monkey chains had been invented by Europeans, probably to be used as an instructive tale in which the priest could admonish the natives who they deemed lazy. This was further corroborated by brothers Philip Van Ness Myers and Henry Morris Myers, who did both extensive expeditions in South America in 1867 and both cited there was no truth to the tale, pun intended. Finally, we have a professor of natural history, E.W. Gudger, who stated the myth evolved from poor observations of the behavior of individual monkeys who were well known to dangle from branches by their tails and swing through gaps using vines. Furthermore, he doubted there would be enough room in the dense jungle to pull off such a maneuver anyways. So if that's the case, how did the myth start and why did it have so much credence? One account that carried some respect was that of Antonio de Uoa, a Spanish naval officer and governor who in 1735 joined an expedition in the Panama region and wrote, the different species of monkeys hanging from branches in other places, six, eight, or more of them, linked together in order to pass a river, and even noted that he knew people would doubt such a claim, but he witnessed it with his own eyes. However, there are earlier accounts. Welsh explorer Lionel Wafer would write that the monkeys would pass from top to top of high trees whose branches are a little too far away from their leaping. Sometimes they will hang down by one another's tails in a chain and swing it in a manner the lowermost catches of another tree and draws the rest of them up. But now we go to the earliest known account, which is a Spanish missionary and naturalist, Padre Jose de Acosta, who in 1589 wrote that he seen monkeys leap from one tree to the next. And when they come to a leap that is too far away, they tie themselves by the tails to one another and make a chain. They launch themselves forward and the first is propelled the furthest and grabs hold and hangs on while the rest go across. This seems to be the origin point and there's no sign that he was intentionally creating a fable. I mean, he was a naturalist and priest. However, the last known account came in 1897 from Charles Holder, a well-respected naturalist who was camping in the Amazon, awoke to see a furry column swing towards the far bank and pivoting from a branch of a tree on the opposite side. He stared for a few minutes until he realized what it was, a monkey chain connected from one river bank to another. 
while the females, young and old, crossed. When Holder laughed, the monkey scattered. So if this ever happened again after 1897, it's not been documented. However, skeptics still believe these stories are just misidentifications and that the only animals ever observed forming a chain are ants. Tartary or Tartaria is a historical name for Central Asia and Siberia, and it's the confusion surrounding Tartary as a place name that has spawned some pretty crazy French theories in the past couple of decades, which includes this place called the Tartarian Empire that is allegedly a lost civilization with advanced technology and culture. The theory that this was a suppressed lost civilization originated in Russia with aspects appearing in Anatoly Fomenko's book, New Chronology. And if you're not familiar with those books, you're missing out. Because it's here, Fomenko claims that Jesus lived in the 12th century, and that the Trojan War and the Crusades were the same thing, and that the Mongols were actually Russians, and that the lands west of the 13 colonies were a far eastern part of Siberian American Empire prior to its disintegration in 1775. So as you can see, this guy has some great theories. But the one we are discussing is that of Tartaria, and originally, it was pushed to be linked to Russia. But since about 2016, the conspiracy theory gained momentum on the internet, and it's kind of been separated from its Russian origin, and has taken on a new life of its own. The theory is tied to the alternative view of architectural history, and boy, is it a doozy. According to the theory, demolished buildings such as the Singer Building, the original New York Penn Station, or the temporary grounds of the 1915 World's Fair were actually buildings of a vast empire based in Tartary that has been suppressed from history, as well as lots of other luxurious American buildings constructed in the late 19th century to this Tartarian empire, which even includes the White House. And how can we forget? They also have ties to ancient Egypt, and they built the Great Pyramid, now you may be wondering, how did an empire so advanced that it created free wireless energy and one that supposedly had even achieved world peace, how could this empire have fallen and remain hidden? Well, that's where the mud flood comes in. Apparently, this mud flood wiped out much of the world via depopulation and old buildings sometime in the 1800s, which allowed the nations we know of today to pop up. Some of this is even further supported by the many buildings across the world that have architectural elements like doors, windows, and archways submerged many feet below ground. Most of this is due to the pictures of old buildings that have a basement half window or some random building that was in the middle of construction. They also claim that in early photographs from the turn of the 20th century, you see deserted city streets in many capital cities across the world but once people start popping up in these photographs, you notice the contrast between people in horse and cart going across muddy streets, but in the backdrop, you see highly ornate stone megastructures which tower above these inhabitants. I guess this is supposed to imply that these people wandered into these beautifully built cities left over from the Tartarians. Finally, the last proof of evidence is basically any photo you find from the 1800s that shows someone digging well, that's supposed to be proof of the people digging themselves out of the mud flood. This theory has been described as the QAnon of architecture, and I think it's best we just leave it there. This story comes from the website yourghoststories.com and is told by a middle-aged adult from Limerick City, Ireland. In this story, he would state the whole thing begins shortly after his grandmother, whom he dearly loved, died. Three days later, the poster, Dark Light 99, would state that he was lying in bed when a ghostly figure started hovering in the corner of the room. It had tentacles, and for a minute, looked like the Virgin Mary's cloak floating. But as he looked closer, he noticed its odd mouth. It was black and round, and it looked like an octopus, except it was transparent like a jellyfish. And then, Crazily, his grandmother came out of the octopus's mouth, still in the posture she was inside her coffin, 
with her clothes on, and then she laid down beside him. She tried to talk, but only murmured, and her eyes would not open. His girlfriend at the time was pregnant and in the other room. The poster would tell his grandmother he loved her and to go on. She would be all right, and he would not worry, but he did cry. She hovered up back into the air, and the octopus led the way through a wall to where his girlfriend slept. A couple of months later, his baby girl was born, and she looked just like his grandmother. She made the same facial expressions and everything, reminding him of her every day. He considered it a blessing, and noted his research found that the ancient Celts believed the octopus carried the soul into the afterlife. So that's a lot to take in, but we're basically left with two simple theories. The main one is, the original poster was so overwhelmed by stress and grief that he imagined the whole event, or hallucinated, or it was a dream. This has been known to happen to people who are experiencing extreme grief. The second theory is, well, it was his grandmother, and this was a paranormal event. Skyquakes are a phenomenon where a loud booming sound comes from the sky. It may cause noticeable vibration in a building or across a particular area. It's described as being like distant but inordinately loud thunder. While no clouds are in the sky large enough to generate lightning, those who have heard cannons state the sound is nearly identical. They have been heard all over the world and here on the east coast of the US to as far away as Alaska and southern Canada. There's actually several theories for this one. First, is that of a coronal mass ejection, which often generates shock waves similar to that of a sonic boom. There's also the thought that meteors entering the atmosphere can cause the sonic booms, or military aircraft, although that one doesn't explain the sounds heard before supersonic flight. Then there is the thought that it's gas escaping from vents in the Earth's surface, or shallow earthquakes, where there is very little vibration, but sound is still heard. Then you also have underwater caves collapsing, volcanic eruptions, weather events, or avalanches. December 29th, 2001, 6 p.m., Denver, Colorado. An unnamed woman would witness a bright yellow cylinder craft hovering above I-70 just east of Denver. The fear she first felt switched to euphoria, and then after that, she didn't remember, other than waking up in her bed the next morning. Now that's a weird mystery in itself, but the real mystery is what followed over the next two and a half years, because two months after this UFO encounter, moles on her body began to fade away and disappear, and after five months, the hair on her arms and legs began to change color to light blonde, which was strange since she had medium brown hair. The 31-year-old first assumed it was premature graying, but she began to notice the individual hairs change color from the root upwards, and within the five days, the hair had completely changed from brown to red to blonde. Her hair also changed from a medium coarseness to a feather soft fine. Then months after that, the spider veins in her legs began to fade and completely vanished. This was combined with almost nightly dreams of entities who talked to her and claimed to be an intelligent species from somewhere else. She woke up a few times to catch herself uttering in some language that she did not know. And finally, she reported having feelings of hot and cold between different parts of her body, pulsating feelings at the bottom of her feet and up her legs and the palms of her hands. Sometimes pulsating so intense that it was painful. Sometimes it even felt like it was right below her eyes or between her eyes in front of her brain. This was just one account sent into the phantomsandmonsters.com website. And although this is just one account that sounds crazy, there's actually many more stories that are very similar to this woman's. Actually, bodily changes from a UFO encounter seem to be pretty common, with many witnesses claiming to have been cured of illness, eye, and hair color changes, along with some who have even reported alien implants left under their skin. And there's actually been research on this topic for at least a couple of decades. As early as 2003, researchers at Harvard were able to show people who experienced an alien abduction suffer 
from physical effects associated with PTSD. Although, this research showed that the so-called abductions were really nothing more than sleep paralysis. But if the person that experienced that truly believed it to be an abduction, PTSD could occur, with the reactions being as strong or stronger than people who cannot shake memories of combat or abuse or other punishing events. The Harvard head of psychiatry from 1977 to 2004 took it a step further and would note that some abductees even found cuts, ulcers, or triangular lesions after an abduction, while a more recent study in 2021 actually showed that people who had seen a UFO or had claimed to have been abducted experienced issues very similar to that of Havana Syndrome, which of course was first reported in 2016 by U.S. Embassy staff employees in Cuba, which included headaches, fatigue, dizziness, hearing loss, and nausea. The r slash paranormal subreddit is a community where believers come together to talk about their encounters with ghosts, UFOs, demons, and the like. Sometimes it's just theories, or sometimes it's even skeptics who come in to disprove the supernatural. But it's mainly the stories of encounters that brings everyone here. And it's one of these encounters that brings us to our next mystery. The story starts with the Redditor, Lovely Bloom, 1988 who does not cite a year, but I am going to assume going by her name, that this story takes place in the early 90s. Bloom, as I will now call her, would tell of an encounter when she was six or seven years old, living on a ranch in the countryside of Laredo, Texas. The area that she lived in was for low-income families, mostly houses that were surrounded by the forest. Her parents would rent a cheap house with no indoor plumbing or central air. She would go on to tell of another low-income family that lived next door. Since they did not have much to eat, these kids would often come over and eat with her family in exchange for helping clean up the house some. And it was an evening after one of these dinners that Bloom, as well as one of those neighbors, the youngest girl, would take a nap together on their bed. Before Bloom's mother woke them and told the little girl it was time to go home because it was getting late. Apparently, this neighbor girl's siblings had left her there since she was asleep. Bloom's brother was going to walk the little girl home, but Bloom, who was roughly the same age as the neighbor girl, wanted to walk her home instead, as the two were friends. Her mom allowed her to, and the two started walking towards the neighbor's home, and here is where things get a little bit wonky. Bloom would report that out of nowhere, the girl comes running behind her crying and is pulling her down by the shoulders. She would ask the girl what was wrong, and the neighbor girl would point up to some abandoned train cars. In Bloom, well, she seen something unbelievable. There were three skeletons atop of the train. One of them was laying on its side with clothes on. The other two were walking back and forth behind that one. They would even stop and wave to them. The girls obviously panicked and ran back to Bloom's home and told her mother what they seen. Her mom and brothers would go out to see what exactly it was that these two little girls had witnessed. And surprisingly, the skeletons were still there, and they were still waving. The family would pick up rocks and throw at them, and it seemed like the rocks went through them, like it never even phased them. Although Bloom did concede that maybe they just missed, they eventually gave up and walked home and never seen them again. In total, five people seen these skeletons. The problem with mysteries like this that come from Reddit or other forums is it's just one person's account, and there's no other documentation of it, so it's hard to draw theories. However, Bloom does rule out some theories. She states that she knows people think it was a hallucination, but how could all of them have hallucinated the same thing? She also brought up the theory that they were Halloween props, but she brings up the counterpoint that the technology for Halloween props in the early 90s was not that advanced yet, leaving us with a theory that maybe it was a real paranormal event. What if you could take something that would allow you to enter another dimension? This was the question and our mystery that the late ethnobotanist Terence McKenna would ask, or should I say claim, back in 1965 after smoking DMT 
in Berkeley, because according to McKenna, after consuming the required amount of the psychedelic, he would pass into some kind of hyperdimensional space where these machine elves are said to inhabit. He would claim you would go through a membrane of sorts and then see these self-transforming machine elves singing in a hyperdimensional language they would then surround the person and say, welcome, we're so glad to see you. They then transform themselves and the objects surrounding them into a fluorescent playpen of heels and flashing lights. And while it's easy to just blow this off as a drug-fueled delusion, the thing that makes it stand out is Terence isn't the only person who has encountered these beings. Between the years 1990 and 1995, University of New Mexico Associate Professor in Psychiatry Dr. Rick Strassman would take a deeper dive into the mystery. He would give DMT to 60 volunteers in a clinical setting and record his findings in the book DMT, The Spirit Molecule. He hadn't really believed McKenna's account prior to this study, but he soon found out that the people who participated in the research frequently reported contact with these machine elves, at least 50% of them, although some reported seeing insectoids like mantises and bees, as well as spiders, cacti, stick figures, reptilian humanoids, and clowns. Some of the volunteers were welcomed with open arms and a loving embrace, while others reported that these beings performed experiments on them. But the most interesting part about this study, none of the volunteers got to speak to each other about their experiences, so the results were not influenced by one another, yet ended up being very similar. Another study was conducted in 2020 by researcher Jennifer Locke, and her analysis showed similar results, but there was one varying difference. The majority of people, 29%, reported to have seen poorly defined or unclear entities, followed by humanoid beings such as regular people, shadow people, hooded figures, goblins, cartoons, etc., then divine beings such as angels, demons, or Jesus, and then aliens, followed by machine elves, which was the fifth most reported being. So the mystery remains, do human beings dream up similar hallucinations when taking DMT, or is this drug somehow allowing people to actually visit a place where these beings exist? According to a study by the Journal of Psychopharmacology, of the 2,561 adults who had encounters with entities while on DMT, 81% of them reported their encounters were real, while only 9% of them believed they had dreamed it up. And as a personal side note, I have an online gaming friend who has actually experienced this twice. I spoke to him, and he gave me permission to speak about it. First, the experience affected him enough that he actually went and got a tattoo of the being he saw in this dimension. You can see it pictured here. Secondly, he wanted me to relay that he fully believes it is a real dimension and not an illusion created by the brain. Have you ever heard the story about those hikers who perished in Russia under mysterious circumstances? No, I'm not talking about Dyatlov. I'm talking about Kamar Daban. A mystery that unlike Dyatlov happened fairly recently, taking place in 1993. Our story begins in the Buryatia region of southern Siberia, which is the home to the Kamar Daban mountain range. It's an often traveled to destination for tourists and especially hikers. It's here that the 41-year-old Yudmila Karovina, a skilled survivalist and hiking instructor, often referred to as a master by her students, would make plans to walk the Kamar Daban mountain range in the summer of 1993 along with six of her pupils. Karovina was knowledgeable about the region, and the location was actually a pretty safe place to hike. The student that was closest to Karovina was a 23-year-old named Alexander Crisson, who she viewed like a son since she had known him for most of his life. The other students, and I'll probably mess these names up, were Tamur Bapinov, 15, Victoria Zelasova, 16, Valentina Utochenko, 17, Tatiana Filipenko, 24, and Dinesh Foskin, 19. The seven arrived at the mountain range in the village of Marino on August 2nd. The forecast showed clear sunny skies. Now while this was going on, 
There were two other hiking groups in the area. One of these was led by Krovina's daughter, and Krovina and her daughter's group were supposed to meet on August 5th, just three days later. The first two days of the hike went great, and they were making excellent time. But when they started their descent, the forecast showed to be inaccurate because a heavy rain would begin. The hiker's pace slowed down, caused by the extra weight of the now-soaked supplies, and it's here that Karovina would make the decision to set up camp in an exposed area instead of the nearby tree cover because the group of hikers were just too exhausted. They failed to set a fire, but were still in excellent spirits. The next morning, they were able to build a fire and had breakfast. They then left to meet up with the other group, led by her daughter, Natalia. They actually, in spite of this little setback, were making excellent time. However, as Natalia and her party arrived later that day, her mother's group was not there. After waiting for some time, they continued on. Natalia was not worried and actually assumed that the poor weather had delayed them. But it would be five days later, on August 10th, the expedition would take a dark turn when a group of kayakers on the river at the foot of Kamar de Bon Mountains would observe something in the tree line while they were paddling down river, that of a lone girl standing and staring at them. Some variations of this story cite that she was coated in dried blood. The kayakers approached her and she broke down into tears. She told them she was Valentina Udochenko, the 17-year-old who had been hiking with six other people. The kayakers, not knowing exactly what to do, would take Valentina back to the local police department and filed a report there and were really just getting started because Valentina, well, it would take her many days before she would tell the officers what happened. And even then, it was confusing and dreadful. According to her, after eating breakfast, they descended the mountain, but shortly into it, a catastrophe occurred. From the back, Alexander, the 23-year-old, began to scream and when she turned back to look, he was frothing at the mouth, bleeding from his eyes and ears. He collapsed to the ground, shaking before becoming motionless. Karovina, who was like a mother figure to him, sprinted over and told the others to continue on. Meanwhile, she kept trying to wake Alexander, and now things would get worse. Because the group had not got far, when they turned around to see their teacher, was also gushing blood from her eyes and nose and foaming at the mouth. She shook violently before falling on top of Alexander, and it must have been a natural reflex because the rest of the group, outside of Valentina, rushed over. Tatiana, the 24-year-old, would make it first, and she would begin clutching her throat as if she had trouble breathing, before making her way to a nearby rock where she bashed her head into it until she went limp. Dennis, meanwhile, would stop and crouch behind a rock as Tamur and Victoria would turn and flee Valentina, the one the kayakers had found, had frozen up and had not moved any. Tamur and Victoria did not make it too far. They began ripping off their clothes, spinning up blood and tearing at their throats before passing out and dying. The only two that remained were Dennis and Valentina, and they sprinted from the scene. However, it didn't take long until Dennis collapsed violently. Now, Valentina in a panic continued to flee with the only thing on her back being a tent and her clothing. She tried to get as far away as possible and eventually stopped and put up her tent that night. When she awoke the next morning, she realized she was in a dilemma. The only way she could survive and make it back to civilization was to go back and collect the resources she had dropped during the panic. Seeing as she had no choice, she went back, retracing her steps. When she arrived, she discovered None of her friends had moved from the night before, but she did not have time to grieve. She quickly gathered the supplies from their bodies and followed a set of power lines down the mountain for four days in hopes of finding a town. She eventually found a river, which she followed, and later that day ran into the kayakers. It took two weeks, the 24th, for a search to be carried out, although part of this was due to Valentina not telling the story right away and two days after the helicopters were brought in, the bodies were found. Autopsies would be carried out, and strangely, didn't match up with Valentina's version of events. According to the medical examiner, each hiker on that mountain died from hypothermia, except for the teacher, who had a heart attack. They also had bruised lungs and a protein shortage brought on by starvation. 
It was ruled an accident and the case was closed, which leaves all kinds of questions and brings us to theories, which there are many of. The first, and the one most people point to, is they stumbled onto a Russian military experiment and were all killed as a result. The police and medical examiner then covered it up, and considering they had taken a different route than usual through this area, it's possible they ran into someone out working on a top secret military project. However, there's a couple of flaws. First, is there are a ton of tour groups that come through this area every summer. Why in the world would you pick it to do your top secret research? Secondly, the place where the hikers died was an open space, both viewable from the air and higher elevation. Again, would be stupid for a top secret project here, and that doesn't even speak to the larger point, which is allowing Valentina to live. Next, we go to the nerve gas theory, particularly the deadly Novichuk, which the autopsy findings, like lung bruising, match up perfectly with exposure to nerve gas. It could have even put them into a coma or rendered them unconscious and then they did die from hypothermia. And speaking of Novichuk, it was created the same year, 1993. But again, a couple of issues. Where did the gas come from? And again, why was Valentina spared? Another plausible theory is that the group indeed passed away from hypothermia, which matches up with the paradoxical undressing, so that makes sense. But maybe the account was so traumatic for Valentina that she remembered details wrong or had delusions or PTSD. Remember, it took her days before she would even speak to the police about what had happened. Going to the next theory, Karovina was known as a forager and she would teach her students the craft, but this theory has proposed that a student picked up the wrong kind of mushroom for everyone to eat, that being psilocybin mushroom, aka magic mushrooms. The effects started to set in as they walked down after breakfast, making them hallucinate. And one of the most common hallucinations is to see other people crying blood. Overdoses lead to psychosis, convulsions, cardiac arrest, or a coma, which again, could have led to hypothermia. And Valentina survived cause she had fewer mushrooms or had a genetic predisposition that left her less impacted. Another theory was that the group had been practicing extreme survival techniques during their hike, like taking minimal equipment and trying to survive by foraging. In fact, the investigators were only able to find one meal that the group had eaten the entire time. It's thought that Valentina survived by constantly eating rose root, which is rich in vitamins, while the others died of malnutrition. There's also other minor theories like that of altitude sickness or that nerve gas was being tested in the mountains and the rain disturbed it and caused it to fall down onto the group. Have you ever gotten that strange feeling that someone is staring at you and when you turn around to look, you end up seeing that someone indeed is staring at you? Guess what? You're not the only one. This is a widely experienced phenomenon that most people have been through at least once in their life. In surveys across Europe and North America, between 70 to 97% of people have had this experience. It is most commonly reported to happen with strangers in public places such as streets and bars. And maybe not surprisingly, 81% of women versus 74% of men have reported this feeling. But maybe in somewhat of a surprise, 88% of women said they could stare at others and make them turn around, where only 71% of men reported they could do the same. The number one reported reason for staring is overwhelmingly simple curiosity, followed by a desire to attract the other person's attention, less frequently with sexual attraction or anger. What's really strange with this mystery is what was found with police officers, private investigators, and soldiers. Because detectives, during training, are specifically told that when following people, do not stare at their backs any more than necessary because otherwise, that person could turn around and catch them, blowing their cover. This is also learned by paparazzis as well as police slash military snipers who again are trained not to stare any more than they have to. But this does not apply to humans alone. It seems animals are able to detect stares as well. Sleeping dogs or cats can be awoken by owners who stare at them, while hunters and wildlife photographers have reported being convinced 
that animals can detect their gaze, while conversely, have reported they felt they were being stared at by animals. So if this phenomenon really exists, is it due to some evolutionary cause, maybe stemming from the context of predator-prey relationship? Surprisingly, there was very little research done on this until the 1980s. Before then, there were only five reports on it, and two of these were never published. And that may be due to the fact that the early research on this subject stated the whole thing was just an illusion. The first report was by Edward Titchener, a professor of psychology at Cornell University, in which he claimed in 1898 that the rational explanation that people tend to turn around anyways, and if by chance they see someone looking at them, they remember it. If no one looks, they forget it, and vice versa. Someone might attract attention of someone behind them by turning around. He then carried out experiments with his students and wrapped the whole experiment up, saying his theory was right and that was it. Since he was highly respected, there was very little research after this and no one really wanted to disagree with him. Actually, his theory is still cited by skeptics to this day. John Coover would be the next, a psychologist who carried out experiments at Stanford. He would have people work in pairs. One was the subject and the other was the looker. The subject sat with his back to the looker, who in randomized series of trials either looked or did not look. The subject would then have to guess whether he was being stared at. Coover found no significant ability to detect stares, and cited the subjects could only detect it 50% of the time, meaning that it was pure chance. By 1939 though, there would be a more open mind to this research, and that might have to do with Coover and Titchener being deceased at this point, because Johannes Portman, a Dutch professor of metaphysics, would conduct similar experiments that would show the subject was right more often than wrong about someone staring at him. It would be another 39 years before further tests were carried out. One was done with a one-way mirror, and again, where the person staring was invisible to the subject, and again, he was shown that the subject was able to tell when the person was staring a significant majority of the time. Finally, in the 1980s, a study in Australia set the subject in a room with a camera, and again, the subject was able to detect when a person was brought into a different room to watch the closed circuit television of the subject. These people detected it 74% of the time. Since the 80s, thousands of tests have been carried out. There's small variances in how the experiments are done, but all work under the same principle, that of a person trying to detect another person staring at them. After the tens of thousands of people tested since 1998, the results are consistent, always hovering around 55% who can guess it right, more than the 50% expected by chance. Although skeptics claim that 5% may be due to the fact that the person is trying to catch someone staring at them versus the people who are just not focused on it. And there's very little real life research done where the participants are not informed. But there was at least one, when English author and Harvard scholar Alfred Sheldrake would conduct an experiment in the early 2000s where he brought in a group of people who thought they were coming into a studio as an audience member for a quiz game show. They had their backs to an office window made of darkened glass and the lights in the office were switched off so the people were not able to see in. But inside this room were six lookers who had random times where they would pick one person from the room and stare at them for one minute. In 39 of these stares, 27 times, the subject would turn around to look at the dark room, or roughly about 70% of the time. However, skeptics are still, well, skeptical. The late University of Kentucky professor of psychology, Robert Baker, conducted his own test. He would go sit in a library and kinda hit out, and then stared at students for about nine minutes. He would then walk over and asked them to fill out a response sheet. 35 out of the 40 said they had no idea he was staring at them, while two of them felt they were being observed and felt something was wrong. Three others were noticeably shook up. They at points had stood up and would look around, shift their position several times, and were distracted. However, and this goes back to the sheep-goat argument in part one, Baker dismissed these three people who claimed they felt like they were being stared at because, well, it went against his theory. He would state they were not affected by his staring, but because they felt something was wrong, which doesn't make sense. He also discarded the other two 
who stated they felt they were being observed because he claimed they were suspect, as one of them believed they had extrasensory perception. And although, once again, this is a skeptic dismissing the claim because it goes against his theory, the more unsettling part would be to catch this guy staring at me behind a plant in the university library. I would be mildly concerned. There has been other skeptical research done on this phenomenon, but by and large, they have generally failed. However, it's still not explained why this occurs, and that is the mystery. May 1st, 1995. Brian Hance, a freshman at the University of Arizona, was thumbing through the Daily Wildcat, the college newspaper, when he seen a full-page advertisement on page 16 that kind of made him stop and do a double take. It was jumbled with maps, math, portraits, words and phrases that didn't really make a lot of sense. The ad referred to a group called the Orphanage, and the words May Day appeared in big bold letters at the top, while towards the bottom, a small illustration of a smirking man with two dots for eyes and ears drawn like potatoes seemed to be a signature of sorts. Brian thought the whole thing was odd, but wrote it off as the work of a fraternity and went on. The following year, again on May 1st, he would come across a similar ad. This time, he had maps, math equations, and a quote from the book Moby Dick, in which Starbuck, the first mate, says I will have no man in my boat who is not afraid of a whale. The ad also contained the same crude drawings of the same man as the year before. Again, Brian blew it off. But it was the following year that Brian, now a junior, would join the newspaper staff as one of its first webmasters. And this time, when the ad popped up in 1997, he had the tools to look deeper into it. He would begin to go through the newspaper archives and was able to find that this ad went back to at least 1981. Coming on May 1st, over several of the following years, someone had paid thousands of dollars to place it in this university newspaper. But who and why? That is our mystery. And not just ours, but several people. As this has been looked into by podcasts, videos, message boards, and TikTok. It has even drawn in some online detectives for over a quarter of a century. Brian himself would eventually create the website MaydayMystery.org which included every scan from May Day since 1981, along with other clues from the mystery that actually went even further back. It would actually be Brian's senior year that he would get an interesting email about his work, and it was signed by the orphanage, the same name that caught his attention those three years before. All it said was, the day you see the door, you will be welcomed inside, which is pretty cryptic. Brian himself would stay in the area after graduating and continued to try and crack the mystery. He would even get phone calls from people claiming to be from the orphanage, letting him know of a forthcoming ad. Around this same time, a woman named Kate Vesley, who grew up in Tuscan and had actually went to the University of Arizona just a few years after Brian, also became hooked on the mystery, spending numerous hours studying it. She would eventually contact Brian and then started a Facebook group in hopes of bringing people together to try and finally crack the puzzle. It would be here, along with other platforms, such as Reddit. She would finally come up with a theory. She believed that since the 1970s, a group of University of Arizona alumni had formed some sort of intellectual fraternity, using the newspapers to communicate with each other about subjects that were important to them, and that the ads started as a game before it perhaps became a tradition. Now who these people were, that was another question but she did have a good idea of who at least one was. That was a man named Robert Hungerford, an attorney who worked for the county criminal justice system. He had been a student at the University of Arizona in the late 60s, and more importantly, was known to be fluent in eight languages, including Latin, Hebrew, Russian, and Greek, which is important considering the ads had used more than a dozen different languages. He had also long been rumored to be the go-between for the group who for decades called the newspaper to place an ad. He himself had eventually even hinted at times that he was the lawyer hired for the secret clients. Kate would actually go to his office to talk to him about the May Day mystery in 2013, but when she got there, she found a business card on the door that said he had retired. 
She decided to leave a note that said, I'm a longtime follower of the May Day Mystery. If you are up for a visit, let me know. She included her email and left. The next morning, she had a message in her inbox. The two would continue to correspond occasionally, but he would never meet in person, nor did he ever really divulge much. He has since went on to message some in the Facebook group and sort of encourages the fans of the mystery without actually saying too much. He says that it can be cracked using the info from the website Brian created. Online sleuths have tried digging into his past, but really haven't found much. While Hungerford himself has given a few interviews where, again, he doesn't really say much, although in one interview, he agreed to answer at least two questions since his clients had authorized that. The interviewer asked who is behind it and what will happen if it's solved. As for who was behind it, Hungerford would say mysteriously, total social slash theological transformation, insipid, August 30th, 1969. As for what will happen if it's solved, well, his reply was just as vague. He would say, a dramatic transformation beyond any sea change. You would need to experience it yourself in order to report the gestalt. He would reveal the mystery began in 1969 when he was a college senior at Arizona, but that the clues didn't always come on May 1st, and they didn't start appearing in the newspaper until 1981, stating you would have had to been on the inside to recognize the clues prior to that. The mystery goes on to this day, and it is still not being cracked, but there are a few theories. Some think the orphanage is linked to a group of ex-members of activist groups, such as the Weathermen, which formed in 1969 as opposition to the Vietnam War. Others think it is an alternative reality game, which is possible since some clues hint at a reward located in a safe deposit box and a bank in Tuscan, while others think it is the work of a secret society or someone with a mental illness. Some, of course, suspect Hungerford is behind the whole thing and that there's no secret group and that he does it for the sole purpose to flaunt his own intelligence. Some have even accused Brian Hance as being behind it, in spite of the fact that when the first ad appeared, he was in elementary school. There's even another theory that Hance and Hungerford are in on it together. Anyone who has dealt with the stock market may have noticed that regular forecast models or investment approaches produce good results over a certain period of time, sometimes just by chance. For example, coin tossing. But what works for one decade might not necessarily work for another. The market is constantly changing. But what happens when some people take a more esoteric approach and win? That's why author Max Gunther set out to find in his 1971 book, Wall Street and Witchcraft. Gunther, known for his bestseller investment book called The Zurich Axioms, was an admitted skeptic. He had actually come up with the idea for the book when discussing ways to disprove profits. He noted that if someone makes a list of 100 predictions, some will inevitably come true. But maybe when it comes to making predictions that affect your finances, one may be more hesitant. And when he heard about people winning in the stock market by using more unconventional means, he decided to put that theory to test. However, he would be surprised to find out that some people, in fact, approach the stock market irrationally and win. The first example he gave was of a man in the mid-1950s who turned up at a brokerage firm with $3,000, or about $34,000 in today's money. He had recently been widowed, and his children had both grown up and moved out. Now he lived alone, he took a shot at the market, something he always wanted to do. He believed he had been gifted with a type of ESP and claimed he always knew what the market was going to do. The brokerage firm listened to the old man and was like, yeah, whatever, and took his orders. But they would be shocked that almost all of his picks turned out to be winners. And when he gained more experience, he got even better, even making money when the market was falling. Purchases like Inland Steel and Kenny National would go up to double and sometimes triple what he paid for them. He was nearly perfect. And about a decade later, by the late 60s, he had made 800000 or about $7 million in today's money, nearly doubling his wealth every year since he first started. Gunther would eventually meet this man, who went by the name T.O. Tully, and would explain his bizarre method. Every day, he would walk down Wall Street, 
and feel what he called an aura. He would go on to explain that this aura was really a mass telepathy. He claimed that whatever was on people's minds that day determined what would be bought tomorrow. The market was nothing more than a psychological engine that he tapped into, or so he claimed, with the numbers of tomorrow being the results of what people had thought of the day or week before. And while that did not work all the time, he admitted, it worked enough for him to have a lot of success. As he ended the interview, Tully, before leaving, would say tomorrow will have one of the biggest price jumps, at least five points, maybe 10. The next day, the Dow went up 11 points. If we go further back to the 19th century, we come across Cornelius Vanderbilt, the same man whom the university in Tennessee would be named after. He had started working on his father's ferry as a boy before borrowing the equivalent of about $2,000, starting his own ferry in business, earning the nickname the Commodore in the process. He would eventually grow this business as well as starting others, eventually building his wealth in railroads, shipping, and the market. And just how did Vanderbilt do so well? By consulting ghosts. He kept several mediums around, someone that can allegedly converse with spirits. These mediums would contact the ghost of dead businessmen who were able to see the future and would then relay to Vanderbilt through the medium what moves to make. These moves, which were usually deemed surprising by many investors, actually worked. You may say they performed excellently. Another example was that of Evangeline Adams, an American astrologer based in New York. She arrived in 1899 and quickly became Wall Street's most famous stargazer. She counseled some of the biggest market players in history. Two of these were Jacob Stout and Seymour Cromwell, who both in their time became president of the stock exchange and died exceedingly rich. Another was J.P. Morgan, who became super dependent upon her readings. These are just a few examples from this book and mystery. There are many more, but obviously I cannot go through them all. Some of the people he called the fillers that feel or see price developments in advance. Others make use of astrology, the progression of the stars, consult useful spirits, use tarot cards, dreams, numbers, a crystal ball. Others would translate the already existing answers from the subconscious, for example, the Akashic Chronicles, into the walking consciousness. Finally, Gunther would ask all respondents he interviewed in the book for a forecast in the stock market, both for the near future, in which the interview took place, in order to check the results, and for the 1970s, at the time when the book was written, which he also published. The respective results have a high hit rate in correlation with each other. However, skeptics still claim that the stock market cannot be predicted in any of these ways, and insist that the people tend to embellish the successes while ignoring the misses. You may have at one time heard the quote, War has changed, spoken by Solid Snake in the video game Metal Gear Solid 4. And while he was making a point on something totally different, one part of war that has definitely not changed is mankind's desire to set someone on fire at a distance. And while Vietnam is forever linked with napalm, thermal weapons go back a ways. Actually, they go back to ancient history when they were being used as early as the 9th century BC as the Assyrians used catapults to launch incendiary arrows and pots containing combustible substances onto the enemies. While Thucydides noted in the Siege of Delium in 424 BC, a long tube on wheels was used which blew flames forward using a large bellows. This would be followed by Roman author Julius Africanus, who wrote in the 3rd century AD that a formula for automatic fire had been created. This could then be lit by adequate heat and intense sunlight and used in grenades or night attacks. But maybe the most famous incendiary weapon was that of the Greek fire, which may be famous because of the impression he made on the European crusaders as well as the fact that its formula has been lost to time. It was first created in 672 and is credited to a Byzantine architect and chemist named Callinicus. It was said he had devised the sea fire which ignited Arab ships and burned them with all hands on deck 
ensuring a Roman victory. The accuracy and exact chronology of this account is questionable though, because there are reports of other fire carrying ships equipped with nozzles a few years before Callinicus even arrived, so it's possible he just improved on an already established weapon. But one thing is for certain, that weapon came at the right time. The Byzantine Empire was weakened by its long wars with Persia and had been able to effectively resist, and the Greek fire would be used to great effect against the Muslim fleets. It's because of its appearance during the struggle with the Arabs that it kind of become this divine weapon, with Constantine the Seventh telling his heir to never reveal the secret of the weapon because it had been revealed by an angel to the first Christian emperor, the original Constantine. However, the Arabs would capture one of these ships with the Greek fire weapon, but they were never able to reverse engineer it. By the 12th century, instances of using Greek fire are no longer mentioned. It could be that the Byzantines just lost access to the areas where the primary ingredients were found, or they could have just lost the secret. But what exactly was it made of? That's the mystery. It's important to note here that it was a complete weapon system made up of many key components, all of which needed to operate together to be effective. One of these was the specialized Droman ships that carried it to battle. It prepared the substance by heating and pressurizing it, then siphon projecting it onto the enemies. The operators and technicians were also aware of the secrets of only one component. That way, no enemy could gain its knowledge entirely. We do know that it burned on water and could only be extinguished with only a few substances, such as sand, strong vinegar, or old urine, presumably creating a chemical reaction. The substance was liquid and not a projectile, and it was a liquid fire that was usually ejected by siphon, although earthenware pots or grenades were also used. It also was accompanied by thunder and smoke. Several theories have been suggested regarding the composition of Greek fire, including the use of substances like quicklime, saltpeter, petroleum, or other flammable materials. Because of the thunder and smoke description, saltpeter has long been thought as the key ingredient, along with the fact that it was projected at a distance by siphon, which led to the theory that it was an explosive discharge, hence an early form of gunpowder. However, that's largely been dismissed since saltpeter was not used until the 13th century, and besides, that mixture would have acted much differently from the siphon projected substance described. Since it was inextinguishable by water, and in some accounts, water was said to intensify the flames, some suggested the destructive power came from the explosive reaction between water and quicklime. Quicklime was used by the Byzantines, but the problem is, it has to come into contact with water, and there's too many accounts of it being shot up onto the dry wooden ship decks, although some of these ship decks would have been wet. It still doesn't explain why the grenades worked without water. Most scholars now believe the primary ingredient was crude or refined petroleum, sort of like napalm. The Byzantines had access to crude oil, which was called naphtha by the Persians and was called Median oil by the Greeks, which leads to the alternate name for Greek fire as Median fire, which seems to corroborate that naphtha or crude oil was the key ingredient. Resins were probably then added as a thickener to increase the duration and intensity of the flame, possibly pine tar or animal fat. It was most likely then used by a weapon that consisted of three components, a bronze pump which pressurized the oil, a brazier to heat the oil, and the nozzle which was covered in bronze and mounted on a swivel. The brazier burning fuel would produce an intense heat which created the smoke, then heated the oil in an airtight tank above it. The substance was pressurized by the heat and the usage of a force pump. After it reached the proper pressure, a valve connecting the tank with the swivel was opened and mixture was discharged. The heat was so intense, the heat shields made of iron were necessary. Of course, this is still just speculation, and no one knows quite sure how it worked. This concludes part two of the obscure unsolved mysteries iceberg explained. Goodbye and good night.